Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 50 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. I can't believe it, but not only have we reached episode 50, which is remarkable because most podcasts never make it to episode eight, but tomorrow, October 7, 2015, marks the one year anniversary of Ben Franklin's world. Thank you for listening and for coming on this exciting journey with me. I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of fun. We have explored so many interesting people and events from our early American past, and we've met so many fantastic historians. Also, over the last year, I've learned a lot about podcasting. I won't lie, it's been a challenge at times to keep up with the work for this show, but I try to keep up because I want to bring you an interesting story about early American history each week. I am committed to this work because I truly believe that we must understand the past to know who we are today and how we can build a better future. In fact, I like to think of Ben Franklin's world as a movement, a movement to help restore history to the forefront of the public mind. And I think it's beginning to accomplish its work. Each week, you think historically. You listen to the show, consider its ideas, how they apply to the present day, and how we can use these ideas from the past to build a better future. I also know that you are encouraging your friends, family, and acquaintances to listen to the show and to think historically too. And that is what the movement is all about. Okay, I know you're excited about episode 50, so I really want to get to it. But please stay tuned until the end of this episode, as I have a couple exciting Ben Franklin's World birthday announcements to share, including information about our new apps. Back to episode 50. I knew this episode needed to be big. It needed to have a great topic and a fantastic guest. I also wanted this episode to honor you by fulfilling your number one most requested episode topic, information about everyday life. With this in mind, I am excited to introduce you to Marla Miller, who will help us explore the life of Betsy Ross, an everyday early American woman who has a bit of myth and mystery that surrounds her life. During our conversation, Marla reveals what it was like for Betsy and other men and women to work in an 18th century upholstery shop, how Betsy Ross experienced the war for independence, and whether Betsy Ross sewed the first flag of the United States of America. Are you ready to discover more about this fascinating woman? Let's meet our guest, Marla Miller. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an award-winning historian and the director of the public history program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her primary research interest is women's work prior to the American Industrial Revolution. She is the author of three books, including The Needle's Eye, Women and Work in the Age of the Revolution, and most recently, Betsy Ross and the Making of America, which the Washington Post listed among the best nonfiction books published in 2010. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Marla Miller. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm intrigued by the topic of Betsy Ross, because when we think about it, there aren't a lot of women whom we would consider as heroes or important figures of the American Revolution. But Betsy is is a woman that we would place on that list. And you wrote the first book length biography of Betsy Ross. Would you tell us, you know, how you became interested in the project and why do you think it took historians so long to write a biography of Betsy Ross? Yeah, great question. I stumbled into this when I was writing the introduction to my first book, The Needle's Eye, which is a study of women's work in the clothing trades. And it sort of opens with some contemplation of how we have as a culture forgotten this vast world of female artisanry in early America. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how popular historical imagination is formed about women in work. And so I talk a little bit about Colonial Barbie, which is one of my favorite sort of pop culture artifacts. And I also 
drafted a paragraph about Betsy Ross because I knew that Betsy Ross had worked as an upholsterer in early Philadelphia, but in popular historical imagination, she's always called a seamstress. And so I just wanted to touch on this idea of how we sort of conflate women's work under this very general vision of the seamstress. And so I wrote my little paragraph and I went to the library to try to just cite the scholarship on the real Betsy Ross and was stunned to find almost nothing. I mean, there were something like 200 hits on WorldCat, and the vast majority of them were children's literature. There had been a couple of books by family members that were efforts to prove that the flag story as it's been passed down to us is essentially true, but there had been no academic work on her. And as I reflected on that, it really made sense because, as many of your listeners know, women's history emerged as a field of inquiry in the 70s and 80s. That's right in the wake of the bicentennial. And by the time of the American bicentennial, Betsy Ross had been really reduced to a cartoon character and not taken seriously. And I I really think in that initial era of women's history practice, you know, it would have been a career ending move to try to write a book that takes this story seriously. So I think now that the field has matured, you know, it's certainly appropriate now to take a look at people like that. And I also have to say, this book could not have been written without the advent of the powerful databases that we now use for research. I couldn't have lived long enough to search through all of the records I had to look at to piece this story together from tiny little fragments. And so really, I think it it really couldn't have been done until now when we have those kinds of tools. I want to investigate the life of Betsy Ross, and perhaps at the end of the interview, we can go back to why she was reduced to a cartoon character. But before we move on, Colonial Barbie? I I think we need to hear just a little bit about Colonial Barbie. Yes, I I really adore Colonial Barbie. She came out in the early 90s. I am sure that this is Mattel's answer to the phenomenon that was the American Girls series. And so Mattel came out with a series of historical dolls. There's also Civil War Barbie and Pilgrim Barbie for people working in those fields. And the dolls come with a little booklet, you know, not again as elaborate as the American Girls dolls. Uh, The Colonial Barbie is dressed in red, white, and blue. And the reason I was interested in her is that she's holding a little piece of needlework, which is like a little quilt square. And so I thought, you know, this little booklet where Betsy's quilting, you know, maybe there would be a story in there about how she's contributing to the revolution as some sort of spy inscribing information into a quilt. And and really all the story is, is that she's making a big quilt that says Happy Birthday, America, for the 4th of July. So it's a little disappointing, but it's a it's a great artifact that shows us how pop culture thinks about women, that if we have a doll that's showing an early American woman, she must be Well, other than the fact I'll probably go on eBay to see if I could find one, I'm glad you said that this was a modern day occurrence because you said Colonial Barbie and I'm picturing little colonial girls playing with Barbie and it just just didn't make sense. (laughs) No, but if you go on eBay, you should also look for George Washington Barbie, which you will see why that has its own. Some scholar really should be investigating George Washington Barbie. This is a separate show topic. Exactly. Let's return to Betsy Ross. What can you tell us about Betsy's childhood? So Betsy Ross was one of 17 children born to uh, Samuel Griscom and his wife, Rebecca James Griscom. They were Quaker, and he was a carpenter. And so he worked in the city of Philadelphia. There are receipts showing him working around the city. They lived on Art Street. I don't know where Betsy was born. She might have been born on the New Jersey side. She might have been born in Philadelphia. The family at that stage was moving a little bit back and forth. But she came from a very large family, and had several older sisters who all go into various trades. And so one of the things that most interested me at the beginning of this project, I started by looking at these affidavits that the descendants of Betsy Ross made in the late 19th century as they're trying to put down on paper the family story of the making of the first flag as they remembered it. And in one of them, Betsy's only surviving daughter at that point mentions that her mother as a young woman 
went to learn the trade of upholstery work at the shop of a Philadelphia upholsterer named John Webster, and that one of her older sisters was already working there at that time. So we get a little glimpse into this artisanal family. She had a brother who became a silversmith. She had a cousin who was really raised with her like a sister who became a mantua maker. Her aunt was a stay maker. And so we can picture her childhood as being really enmeshed in the artisanal world of early Philadelphia. It's full of makers, people who knew how to make and build things. So that's the household she grew up in on Art Street. Was it typical for girls to seek an apprenticeship in early America? I know boys did, but girls? Yes, that's one of the questions I get asked most often when I give talks about her. Yeah, it was not atypical. You know, when she was little, she already had these older sisters who were out doing things. Her oldest sister, Deborah, worked in what was the equivalent of a dry cleaning enterprise in Philadelphia at the time. So it wasn't unusual. I think it comes to look unusual to us today because in that era, those girls didn't need the sort of formal apprenticeship apparatus that we as historians look for today, contracts, indentures, dedicated shops for artisanal work. So in their day, I think they were seen as apprentices, whether or not there's a legal document that calls them apprentices. And so I think it's, it's harder for our era to see that than it was at the time. But no, it wasn't terribly unusual. Certainly girls worked in those craft shops all over the city. What type of goods did an upholsterer produce? It seemed like Betsy was attracted to the upholstery trade, and I wonder if there was something about the materiality of it or the work involved in it that attracted her. Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, that's a great question. There, there's a wonderful engraving uh, in Diderot's encyclopedia of a upholsterer shop, and in it you see the man at the head of the enterprise showing his wares to a male client, but in the back there's this table, and there are five or six women around it fabricating goods, and that's the picture I like to lead people toward of Betsy Ross. I'm sure it must have been appealing at that time to work with the most beautiful materials available in Philadelphia. These imported silks and beautiful tassels. And, you know, I can't imagine that it wouldn't have been pleasurable to get your hands on those beautiful fabrics. Um, what they would have done, these upholstery seamstresses, in essence, they would have made the big flat textiles that enveloped 18th century beds. You know, we can picture those beds with the hangings on four sides, and sometimes they had valances that had to be cut with a fashionable silhouette. Sometimes that silhouette was then embellished with kinds of trim or fringe that had to be fabricated and or applied. They made tassels. One of the fun finds in the research was learning that there's a woman named Anne King who was the supervisor of women's work in Webster's shop. And during the revolution, she hangs out her own shingle as the foremost American tassel maker or something like that is the language in the ad, reminding people if they want to buy American, they should buy from her because she's the best tassel maker in America. And so I can imagine her training girls like Betsy Griscom and others to fabricate those tassels that ornamented bed hangings and curtains. They made window curtains. Upholstery shops produced Venetian blinds, which involved long tapes. Those, too, could have been imported or fabricated. And a big part of it was slip covers. In the 18th century, like today, you know, they understood that sunlight was damaging for expensive silks, and so people often purchased slip covers for chairs at the same time they bought the chair to protect their investment. And it was becoming fashionable to have your room decorated en suite so that everything matched. So if you had, in fact, bought your furniture at different points in time but now wanted to pull the room together, you might order a bunch of slip covers out of a similar fabric to bring the room you know, visually together. So they made those kinds of things. And one of the most important things that women did in those shops was make and refresh mattresses. Every year, wealthy families would want their mattresses refreshed. Obviously, feathers were the preferred filling for the most affluent families, but there were also hair mattresses and plant fillings. And upholstery seamstresses like Betsy Ross 
also spent a lot of time making and refreshing mattresses. And in fact, while we don't have documentation of Betsy working for the Drinker household in Philadelphia, one of her sisters, her younger sister, and so the third of the Griscom girls to go into upholstery work, shows up often at the Drinkers refreshing their mattresses seasonally. And so that's a big part of the upholstery trade for women. In Betsy Ross and the Making of America, Marla describes how Betsy learned the upholsterer's trade and then worked as an upholsterer throughout her life, and yet she was married three times. In previous episodes, we've talked to Lisa Wilson, Rachel Hope Cleves, Michelle Coughlin about coverture, the idea that as soon as a woman in early America married, her husband legally had right to all of her work and wages. Marla, was Betsy Ross affected by coverture? If she's working all of her life, what control did she have over what she made and what she earned from what she made? Right. That's a great question. Um, I know so little about her own family's finances. None of those papers survive. You know, she died in 1836 and... The family did not see any need to preserve those papers. And so I don't know a lot about her specific situation. But of course, she would have been subject to the laws of the day, which would have put her various husbands in charge of her income. One of the ads that I use a lot in my teaching is from the Philadelphia paper, and it's it's for the John Claypool upholster shop. And of course, that's Betsy's shop. This is late in her life. It's in the 1780s. John Claypool was her third husband, married in 1783, and he worked for the Customs House. He was raised in a tan yard. His his dad was a tanner, and so he knew something that was relevant to the upholstery trade, but he was not an upholsterer. And yet, here we have this ad for John Claypool's upholstery shop. And so I like to use that to remind students that if they are doing research on kinds of work that women did, those ads can be very misleading. So, so we do see there his identity literally covering hers in the archival records. Now, I don't know what that means about his actual role in decision-making at the shop. One of the things I notice about that ad is that at the bottom of it is sort of a PS that says, by the way, we're also taking in borders. And I I stopped at that when I first saw it because I thought, hmm, you know, was Betsy all that excited about taking in borders? At that time, they would have had their own children, lots of little kids running around and the work of the upholstery trade. And now they're taking in borders. And I just don't know how mutual the decision making was in that family. It's, it's, it's a frustration that that is sort of behind a veil for me. Is her daily life behind a veil? I mean, what was a typical day like for a craftswoman like Betsy? Did she engage in her work at home and at her business, you know, evenly, you know, that, you know, what we're always talking about today, that work-life balance. Did Betsy have a work-life balance? Well, again, hard to know. I I can only infer from other kinds of evidence sort of indirectly. Their shop would have been at their residence. They would have lived above and behind it. So one of the things that I like to point out to people is that all of the 19th century imagery of Betsy Ross for for reasons that have a lot to do with 19th century cultural needs, show her making the flag in a parlor setting, because by then, of course, we need women to be principally domestic. They never show her in the shop, but she would have worked in the shop in front of their house. Of course, she would have also had all of those child-rearing responsibilities. They went on to have um, several girls. One, One died young, but they have all these daughters. Later in life, those daughters become essential to the flag making enterprise when she has adult daughters and they are getting contracts for massive flags for the federal government, the daughters and also her nieces, the uh, children of her sisters, are all helping fill these time-sensitive and large contracts for the government. So in time, those girls become helpful. But when she's a younger mother, it's hard to know how she managed it all. We really don't have that much evidence about that. Now that we have a general idea of what Betsy did and how she lived, let's transition into her experiences during the American Revolution. During the revolution, there was a non-importation movement. And you mentioned that Betsy was attracted or likely attracted to the upholstery trade because she would have gotten to handle very expensive and exquisite materials and fabrics. I imagine that non-importation affected the ability to acquire those fabrics. Did the American Revolution affect her ability to get to get those fabrics? 
I'm sure it did. Now, she would have been, at that time, still a teenager in the employ of Webster. So it's, in a way, it's more his issue than hers at the top of the enterprise, but it's going to affect whether he continues to need employees like Betsy. But they were certainly struggling. There's a there's a wonderful ad by another very prominent Philadelphia upholster by the name of Plunkett Fleeson, who is reminding his customers that the wallpaper that he sells is manufactured in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, and the paper mache ornaments that he sells are manufactured in Philadelphia. So they're motivated to point out to the Philadelphia clientele what can be had that is made locally. But I sort of wonder whether they were fearful that customers would just try to ride this out, like, you know, not make purchases of anything new. We can put off these new chairs. Let's get the new bed hangings next year, see if this all blows over. So I've I've got to figure that there was concern in the artisanal community that, you know, that this was going to be an issue. But, But we don't know that much about how she experienced it per se. But Again, we find the ad from Anne King, this is a little later, 1775, where she is reminding her readers in the newspaper that she can fabricate these things locally. So if you see an effort among artisans to clarify for consumers what they can buy that is made locally. The revolution would transition into the war for independence. When armed conflict began and as it continued, how did Betsy Ross experience it? You know, again, I wish I knew more about that, but she does lose two husbands during the revolution. Her first husband, John Ross, who she marries in 73, died in January 76. Now, part of the family legend is that John Ross died while he was guarding munitions uh, for the city of Philadelphia. I could never find any archival evidence to document that, but that is the family story. Then she's a widow. So she's a widow on her own during the occupation of Philadelphia. I can only imagine what that might have been like for her. Possibly she moved back home with her parents, but we don't know. And then she marries a second time, a mariner named Joseph Ashburn. During the war, he turns privateer and is captured at sea and taken to Mill Prison in England where he dies. So she's widowed twice during the war. Her sacrifices are fairly tangible. Uh, She did have a child with Joseph Ashburn. So while he is away and and dies in England, she is also the single mother of an infant child. So I wish I had more direct evidence of how she experienced the revolution itself, but those facts alone suggest, you know, the difficulty of those years for her. They also suggest that she probably had a typical experience of being a a widow, young, being a young mother alone, trying to provide for herself and her family while her husband, the traditional breadwinner, is away. That's right. You know, one of the things that emerged for me over the course of the research is the importance of her sisters. You know, they were going through it all together. And I do think she had that kind of support through the war. From what I can see, those sisters were fairly close. And after the war, Betsy, as as her older siblings pass away, she becomes the anchor of the family, Aunt Claypool, and their house on Front Street is kind of the center of the household's activity for all the cousins and her kids. And you see her sort of assume that role. But while they were all younger women during the revolution itself, I... I think that they could really lean on one another going through similar things. Her brothers-in-law were also involved in the war. So I think that she had community as she went through that. When we think of Betsy Ross, though, we think about her in association with the American Revolution and its war for independence. And it seems like you didn't find a lot of documentary evidence (laughs) about her, her life during that period. So that leads me to wonder, fact or myth, Marla, did Betsy Ross really sew the first flag of the United States? (laughs) Right, right. Um, Of course, that is the main question that brings people to the project, which is fine. What I wind up, what I wind up saying is, I think there is a kernel at the bottom of it all that is plausible. So, in the family legend, as it comes down in the 19th century, they tell a story about George Washington 
Robert Morris and George Ross coming to her shop, and Washington allegedly has this drawing of a flag that they have in mind with the red and white stripes and the blue canton and these stars, but that they're six-pointed stars. And Betsy is remembered in this family story to have said, well, that's all fine. I can do all of that. But, you know, these six-pointed stars might be an issue. Let me show you something. And so she's supposed to have taken this little piece of paper or cloth, folded it just so, and with a snip of her scissors, out comes this perfect five-pointed star. And they're remembered to have said, oh, yeah, that looks great. And they take it back to Congress, and it's approved. And lo and behold, we have the first flag. Now, we know that there is no first flag because the design of the flag is in question through the whole of the war, the Flag Act notwithstanding. So it's not that simple. I mean, it's war. It's a messy thing. It's clear that that winter, Philadelphia, Congress has approved the building of a Navy. Women all around Philadelphia are getting contracts for the suites of flags that those ships must have at sea. She is a young widow. John Ross died in January of 76, and this event in family memory is supposed to have occurred in May of 76. So here she is, a young widow in need of an income. And so I like to think about this as Betsy Ross, government contractor. She is looking at that and coming at it not from a design perspective. That's the way we mostly talk about Betsy Ross. But I want to encourage people to think of this as the artisan. She is saying, this is all fine, but if you're going to need a lot of these and fast, this design is a superior method for production. And so when she tells this story to her family years later, she never claims that she had anything to do with the making of the first flag. For her, it's a story about having met the father of our country and having taught him something. And so I I like to think, you know, she might have had that one little hand in it. Maybe there's a, a, a whiff of truth about that, that she did suggest five-pointed stars are going to be a superior production method. And that was her contribution. I mean, by the time this came to her, this idea of stars themselves is apparently already in place. The stripes already in place, the blue canton in place. But this is her one little piece of it. And... Um, Later, after the war, when Francis Hopkinson claims credit for having designed the first flag and he submits a bill to Congress for that work, they basically come back and say, you know, a lot of people had a hand in that and no one person can claim any credit. And that's how I would like to encourage people to think about this flag. A lot of people had a hand in it. She might have been one of them, but there's no single point of origin for the flag. With what little we know about this episode, if it in fact was an episode with the flag, it does seem like she probably met George Washington. So that part of the the legend may also be fact rather than just myth. Yes. In fact, there's been a big discovery on that front after the book came out. Uh, The folks down at Mount Vernon are right now in the midst of reinstalling some of the rooms. And so they have been reviewing Washington's financial records in order to determine how best to install the rooms. And they came across a line in a cash memoranda book. The book itself is out at the Huntington Library, but they have it on microfilm. And in September of 74, George Washington visited the upholstery shop of John and Betsy Ross and purchased a set of calico bed hangings. He had been to dinner the night before with Benjamin Chu, and the Rosses had done work for Benjamin Chu a couple of times over the years. And so what appears to have perhaps happened is that he told Chu that he was looking for someone to do this for him, and Chu said, oh, you might try John Ross's shop, and Washington does go there the next day. So in the book, I spend some time speculating about how Washington may or may not have known the Rosses because the family has some theories about that that I felt like I needed to work through. But now we know that he definitely did visit their shop a couple of years before the flag episode. So he knew her before he went in there in 76, if he did do that. Does that revelation change anything else about your book? You know, I don't think so. Um, It really just shores up, I think, a little bit the family claim that, you know, he did know her. And if if when this moment came that the city needed a flag, this committee, 
he did know her. You know, it's it's just a little bit more evidence that the, there is something plausible at the bottom of the family story. You know, one thing I, I like to mention when I talk about Betsy Ross is how children mangle the stories of their parents and grandparents. You know, so we we don't even really know what Betsy Ross said happened. We know what her nephew said happened, and he got it from her daughter, Clarissa. So already when William Canby tells this story to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in 1870, you know, he's a couple of handshakes away from it already. So I, I always kind of want to remind people to, you know, let Betsy off the hook a little bit because she might be spinning in her grave saying, that's not what I said. So I just, um, you know, she, she did not necessarily make some of the claims that are associated with her. It's later generations who, might have, who we know got some of the facts muddled because some of it doesn't add up. What do you think the fact that Betsy lived in Philadelphia meant for her overall experience of her life? And I, by that, I mean, she lives in Philadelphia, which is arguably the center of this transition between colonial America, revolutionary America, and early Republic America. Do you think her, her life in Philadelphia affected the way she experienced that American transition and the ways she was able to get through that transition? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, that's the heart of it all, right? It's the big city. Things come there first. Trends come there first. Uh, news comes there first. And so surely being part of this big urban community was a major factor in, in shaping her experience. Uh, she does not live to see industry come and transform the upholstery trades, but her daughter does, lives to see the sewing machine come to Philadelphia and how much that transforms every part of their work. So they're really, in many ways, on the cutting edge of a lot of phenomenon that took longer to get to other places. So I'm sure that being in Philadelphia was pivotal to her experience. Before we transition to the time warp, I have one last question. In Betsy Ross and the Making of America, Marla does a, a fantastic job of covering what we know of Betsy Ross's life, and if not about Betsy specifically, what life was like for early Americans like Betsy, artisans who lived in Philadelphia. But one of the things that Marla traces is the fact that Betsy Griscom Ross Claypool, she's been married three times now, and her husband John Claypool experienced years of wealth and periods of near poverty. And Marla, I wonder how typical it was for early Americans or maybe just early American artisans to experience these types of fluctuations in their economic well-being. Yes, that was one of the most perplexing parts of the research for me, that one minute they're on top of the world, they have a carriage and are consuming at a fairly high level. And then the next thing I'll find are charitable donations to the household from the Free Quaker meeting, which winds up, you know, literally putting shoes on John's feet and providing clothing and putting their kids through school. And so it's a very perplexing picture of their financial fortunes. Um, they will get these large flag contracts, which seems to produce a lot of revenue. And then again, the next thing I know, they are accepting charitable donations. And so it's never been quite clear to me their fortunes, but they are plainly erratic. And I think that is fairly typical. You know, this is an era before safety nets. It's before banking, which I think is interesting for readers to try to get their head around. You're, you're not banking in the way we do today where you have a savings account. And in fact, one of the most exciting finds for me was finding Betsy Ross's bank account in the papers of the Philadelphia Saving Fund Society. So it takes her a long time to do it. But in 1830, with the help of her nephew, she opens a savings account and puts $200 in it, along with one of her nieces, who is that that time living with her. And so when she has an opportunity to avail herself of that kind of resource to even things out, she does do it. But not until much later, the Philadelphia Savings Fund Society had been around for a long time before she decides to avail herself of that, but she finally does. So you see that she is taking steps to secure her future. But I think before that, it really is a roller coaster ride. We see there's a lovely document of her younger sister, Rachel, who, as I mentioned, also became an upholsterer. Rachel never married and supported herself through the upholstery trades for her life. And at the end of her life, she writes her will and gives her house to Betsy and another sister to share and share alike. And that's a very sisterly phrase that, that I 
I really enjoyed finding. But she clearly wants to ensure that her sister is going to have a home. And so it's more evidence that her future is never certain. And I can only imagine the anxiety that causes, but it, it's a very uneven picture. Marla, you alluded to the fact that the reason that we know of Betsy Ross and her f- contributions with the flag is because of her grandsons and other family members. Today's Time Warp question has to deal with that. And now the Time Warp is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Marla, in your opinion, what might have happened if Betsy Ross's grandsons, William and George Canby, had not set out to turn the family stories about their grandmother and her flag making into a national story? What would we remember about Betsy Ross and her efforts today? You know, I'm sure we wouldn't know one thing about her. She would not have entered the historical record. She would not have entered popular historical imagination. So she would languish in obscurity. I think culture craves firsts. And so I think at some point, somebody would have come up with some other firstness about the flag. I think I think the culture needs there to be a point of origin for the national flag. Some other story would have emerged as the making of the first flag from some other participant in that process. And I, I think she would be utterly lost to us today. Now to return to real factual history. At the start of our conversation, you mentioned that Betsy Ross had been reduced to a cartoon character between 1776 and the 1970s. And I wonder now that we know a bit more about Betsy Ross and the historical narrative surrounding her, if you could tell us why you think she was reduced to a cartoon character. So in a way, the answer to that question takes us back to the moment of Canby and the storytelling. When he gives his talk in 1870 to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. It's the eve of the centennial. And people are doing a lot of reflecting, of course, on the revolution. But it's also the midst of suffrage. And so the story of Betsy Ross, I think part of the reason it gets some cultural traction at that time is that it satisfies the cultural need for both sides of the question of where women fit into society. So for women who want to say women are a part of our national story and need to get their due, we have Betsy Ross's contribution to the making of the first flag. For the more conservative point of view that wants to see women associated with the home, her contribution is through what had by the late 19th century become a very domestic task of sewing. And so Betsy Ross was a way to put women on the stage, get a woman in the tableau in a way that satisfies a range of needs. So I think that's why the story took hold when he told it, where he did and when he did. 20 years later, when the Art Street house in which she was believed to have lived was threatened with demolition, there is another big uprising to save the flag house. And it too is sort of bolstered by those same cultural needs. And so, again, she becomes, you know, sort of this token woman of the American Revolution because she satisfies this range of desires. In the 20th century, she's then the subject of, you know, the early motion picture films. There's a little biopic of Betsy Ross that comes out early on in the era of film, and people start to market it. So through the 20th century, you start to get, you know, the dishes and the decanters, and there's a Betsy Ross piano, and and she becomes marketed in a particular way. Now, at the same time, as historical research becomes increasingly sophisticated, people, you know, discover what can be new all along, which is that there is no archival record about this flag story. And so by the 1960s and 70s, when people are just much more sophisticated, the story is dismissed. And it was, in fact, dismissed very early on. I mean, people, there, there isn't really an era where people are sure that it's true. People question it as soon as Canby says it. But 
by the 60s and 70s, it really is dismissed as being just fluffy, you know, mop cap Halloween costume history. And so you see, you know, there literally are cartoons. There's a Betsy Ross and I think it's George Mason, Salt and Pepper Shaker. You know, there's just all that marketing, which made people who were or wanted to feel sophisticated about their understanding of American history dismiss that story as just foolishness. And so she really was written off as all but fictional. I think a lot of people in that generation weren't even sure that there was a real person behind that story, but that it was a basically fictional figure. Well, thanks to you, we now know that she was a real person, and we we know what there is to know about Betsy Ross, especially if we read your book, Betsy Ross and the Making of America. So thank you for that. Oh, I hope people enjoy it. What aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? I'm going back to an older interest. I'm working on a study of women and work in 18th century Western Massachusetts in the half century after the revolution. I'm interested in the social relations of work, the emergence of the middle class, and what happens to gender definitions of labor in a range of occupations as the economy makes its transition toward the market economy of the 19th century that we know. So it's very much micro history, very much a local history project where I'm, again, trying to sort of resurrect and bring to life the lives of women who have otherwise been overlooked. And for those of us that still have questions about Betsy Ross or the work early American women performed, where's the best place to get a a hold of you and to find more information about you? The best place is the website of the history department at UMass Amherst, where there's a little link to me. And then beyond that, there's a link to my own personal website. And so people can find me there. And I'm also on Twitter at Marla at UMass. Marla Miller, thank you so much for joining us on Ben Franklin's World and for helping us explore the life of Betsy Ross. Thanks for having me, Liz. The Betsy Ross House historic site in Philadelphia and Claypool family legend has helped us remember the name Betsy Ross. However, unlike many of the historic people we remember, Betsy lived the life of an average everyday woman. She learned a trade, practiced her trade, gave birth to and raised her children, and she did what it took to live and survive during peace and war. As Marla revealed, we remember Betsy Griscom, Ross, Ashburn, Claypool because family legend gave 19th century Americans a story they longed for, the origins of the first flag of the United States. Does the fact that Betsy lived an average life mean that we should forget her? I don't think so. In fact, I think her story is remarkable because she lived an interesting life, a life that helps us understand how average men and women lived through and experienced the transition from the colonial period to the early republic. You can find more information about Marla, her book, Betsy Ross and the Making of America, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash zero five zero. And now for our exciting announcement. Ben Franklin's World has an app. Actually, it has two apps, one for iOS and one for Android. Both apps will put you within one click of all your favorite Ben Franklin's World episodes. These apps have many features, but here are some highlights. You can listen to episodes either by streaming them or downloading them. You can access show descriptions for each episode, which contain clickable links for each episode's show notes page or the Ask the Historian hotline. You can send me an email right from the app, and you can access a sharing menu that will allow you to spread the word about your favorite episodes via Twitter or Facebook. If you would like to check out these apps, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iOS for your Apple devices or benfranklinsworld.com slash Android for your Android devices. I'm really excited about these apps and how they will let you enjoy easier access to the show. Now, if you have signed up for the Franklin Gazette or joined Poor Richard's Club, you knew about these apps days ago. If you would like the most up-to-date show-related news, you should text BFWORLD to 33444, and that will put you in touch with the Franklin Gazette and Poor Richard's Club. Finally, what has been your favorite Ben Franklin's World episode? Share your answer with me, Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or you can post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in Poor Richard's Club. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.